Good morning, dear friend. I want to welcome you to the Sunday morning broadcast from the Mountain View Independent Baptist Church. It's Preacher Bobby. I want to take just a minute to invite you out to church. If you don't have a home church, we'd love for you to come out and be a part of our church service. We're located on 199 Myers Lane. Just go to Food Line Store. Turn down that row between Food Line Dollar Store and you can see the church in front of you. Sunday school's at 10 a.m., morning worship service at 11, evening worship service at 6, and, sun, and Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 p.m., and our youth group, Kids Connection, they meet at 6. So I want to invite you out. If you don't have a home church, you're certainly welcome to come out and be part of us. We have uh, classes in our youth group and Sunday school for all ages and encourage you to come out. If you do have a home church, well, your pastor will be looking for you there. We want to be in John chapter number four, uh, 14 and verse number 6 this morning and be discussing and uh, teaching a little bit or preaching a little bit about uh, uh, Jesus Christ. This world, it seems like, has uh, just lumps Jesus in with false gods and prophets and other false religions and uh, he is not. He's the only true and only living God. Nobody comes to the Father but by Jesus. Nobody can get saved except by and through Jesus Christ. And uh, he's not just a God among many gods. He's the only true God. He's the only one that came down from heaven. He's the only begotten of the Father. He's the only one that paid our sin debt. And he's the only one that got up from the grave. So John chapter 14 and verse number 6, I want to say uh, thank you to WLAF radio station and for everything they do to make this broadcast possible. My, uh, the whole staff down there, my dear friend Jim Freeman. So I appreciate everything that they do. John chapter number 14, verse number 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Heavenly Father, God, as we bow before you, thanking you for yet another day, thanking you for the opportunity to be in your house, thank you for the opportunity to proclaim your precious word. Now, Father, as we always, we want to request, God, that you would ever bless our first responders, the police, firefighters, rescue squad, God, the doctors, the nurses, our military, and all their families. We pray that you would just search out every family, and God bless every marriage, every home, every child, every husband and wife. God, that you would also bless every preacher, pastor, Sunday school teacher that stands to break the bread of life this day. We pray that we'd see souls saved this Sunday morning. God, we pray for our leaders of our country, Lord, that they would... Turn back to the Lord Jesus Christ and not only the leaders, but God, we pray for our nation, that the nation would turn back to the Lord. We pray, God, for this Bible study. We pray for our uh, message this morning, God, that you would anoint from upon high. Give the power of God upon this message this day. And we'll be so very careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. In Christ Jesus' precious holy name we do pray. And amen. Jesus, well, is the only true Savior. There is none but him. He's the only name given under heaven that one can be saved. When God told Moses, and Moses asked him, who am I going to tell Pharaoh sent me? God said, tell him I am. That's all you need to tell him because there's only one true God. He didn't come, I'm talking about Jesus, didn't come to start a religious movement. He didn't come just to start an organization. He came to buy and bring redemption to lost souls. He came to save the lost souls. We live in a country where our higher education or higher learning and college professors will try to teach you that Jesus is a figment. Of, uh, he's a figment of your imagination. He is something that's been made up. You'll be told and taught in, in, in this world that uh, he's just one God among many. He ain't no different than an, uh, the evolutionists that try to let you know that uh, there is no such thing as a God. This is no God didn't create anything. It's 
evolution. Big Bang. It just happened. They'll try to tell, every cult will try to tell you that their leader is the true God. And if you're not a part of their cult, you don't go to heaven. The Satanists will try to tell you that the devil is the only God to worship. Unbelievers will tell you God doesn't exist. Agnostics will tell you that there's no proof of any God. And all those try to put Jesus on the same level as a myth, as Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, some fable, or he's no different than some pagan or Greek demigod. But might I tell you, Jesus says in verse number 6 of John chapter 14, I am the way. He didn't say I'm the way among many different ways. I am the way. There's one way, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one truth. There's not many truth. There's not many gods. There's not many different ways to heaven. There is one single truth in this world about salvation and a Savior, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and you find it in this Holy Bible. He says also, I am the life. If you want eternal life, you've got to go to the one that gave life to begin with. Does the Bible not specifically say that God created the heavens and the earth? Does the Bible not say that Jesus did, and that God Breathe, laid, uh, bent down and breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of, a, of a Adam that he formed him from the dust of the earth and it wasn't until God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life that then he became a living soul. God created life. God gave life. God sustains life. And God gives eternal life. And so you find... Jesus just isn't a God. He's the God, the only God. But no man comes to the Father except by Him. I think He cuts it pretty clear. He's not among Zeus or some of the other gods that people want to adopt. He's not a false God made up by some religion. He's not equal to Buddha or Buddha equal to him you see when you look at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 6 they came looking for Jesus who who was witnessed as dying on the cross the world at that time saw a man bloody and beaten and dying on a cross they witnesses saw his dead body taken from the cross carried into the grave but then when his believers and came to, to, to anoint him, it's when the soldiers were put as a guard so that no one would steal his body. The angel was sitting on the stone that had been rolled away, not to let him out, but to let them in. And they said these words, he is not here. Now the words that followed, he is not here, wasn't they carried him off. <coughs> He's in a different place. It was, he is risen as he said. What separates Jesus from the made up and the false gods of this world is the fact he defeated death, hell, and the grave. He said, I'll lay my life down, but I'll pick it back up on that third and appointed day. He's not here because he is risen as he said. <coughs> Nowhere. In the history of mankind from the creation of the heavens and the earth and the creation of mankind, did anybody die for the sins of those and then raise up on the third and appointed day? Early that morning, God's heavenly power raised him from the grave. He walked out of the grave, but that was after he paid the sin debt. That was after he went into the innermost part of the earth and set the captives free. He came back out among the living. He defeated death. He's defeated every demon. They, death couldn't hold him. Demons couldn't hold him. Early that morning... 
May I say that Buddha never got up from the dead. Muhammad, Allah didn't. Confucius never did. The Jim Jones of this world never got up from the dead. All the statues that have been worshipped and bowed before that you see around this entire world that are made by the hands of man are not God. They never lived, so they never died, and they never rose again from the day. Only Jesus did that. Jesus proved he had authority over death when he raised the dead in his public ministry. Jairus' daughter, 12 years old, died. He raised her, the widow of Nain's son, died on his way to be buried. God raised him. Lazarus, been dead four days, was in the tomb, already bound and anointed for death. Four days later, Jesus came, said, roll the stone away called Lazarus by name, and he raised him from the dead, and Jesus himself got up from the dead. He raised the dead, then he raised himself. But may I tell you that he didn't do it privately. The Bible specifically tells us that the graves were burst open, five or five hundred were seen by many. He got up out of the grave, walked through the streets, was seen by many, stayed above ground, witnessed it for 40 days, then he ascended on a cloud to heaven. Nobody else could have done that. He did this in front of witnesses. I can just see it as we, as we preach on uh, resurrection morning. As we remember that Jesus got up from the grave on that third and appointed day, I can just imagine he came out early that morning as it began, the day began to dawn. He came out of that grave and he looked around. He looked up at the sky that he created. I believe he took him a big old breath of fresh air. He looked around at the clouds. He looked around as the sun began to rise and shine and the daylight came that day. He looked behind him at the graves that nobody, before he rose that third day, nobody ever had hope at a, at a cemetery. It was a place of death. It was a place of separation. It was a place of no hope. But <clears throat> now that Jesus stands, now you have hope. Now you go to the cemetery, notice that's not the place where it ends forever, but that's the place as Jesus walked through that cemetery, back throughout the land of the living. One day he's coming back to the cemeteries of this world at the rapture of the church, and he is going to raise the dead just like he did that morning. Now you have hope. But not only that, dear friend, he saw people, he spoke to people, he was witnessed by many. They, the ones that saw him die on the cross of Calvary now see him alive. Jesus got up from the grave. Nobody else done that. You can see some of these uh, False gods around this world, you can see the communist leaders that portray themselves as God, as well as leaders. They're dead. You can find dead, their dead bodies still somewhere in the grave. Jesus ain't there. It's empty. He got up. And he also gave us something nobody else could. He gave us a resurrection day. He gave us a resurrection morning. He gave us a Lord's day because he got up on a Sunday morning. That's the Lord's day. That's the day that we worship. That's the day that we go to God's house. Never had a Lord's day. We've never had a risen Savior until Jesus, and he's the only one. My, I mention this while we're at it. The Lord's day Sunday is my favorite day of the week. We get to go to church. We get to worship the Lord. We get to gather together. We get to experience the presence of God. We get to hear singing of the gospel songs that glorify our Savior. We get to hear the preached word of Almighty God and get to feel His presence. We get to witness revival. We get to see people saved, people healed. God gave us all that. He got up on the third day. We worship a risen Savior. Notice what he says, I am the way. 
You want to go to heaven? He's the only way. I am the truth. He's the only source of truth in this world. And may I say that this blessed Bible is the only book of truth in this world that tells us about Jesus. And if you want to go to the Heavenly Father, you got to go through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, His Son got up on that third and that appointed day. No more darkness. You see, death closes grave. Death, Jesus went into the grave, the grave was closed. But on that third day, the grave was opened because Jesus opens the graves. And at the rapture of the church, all those who died saved, God is going to open their grave. I'm telling you something, dear friend. He not only got up from the dead, but Jesus did something that nobody else could do. He calls the sinners. Nobody gets a personal invitation from their Savior except from the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand that we don't even know we're lost until God sends Holy Ghost conviction? And then God the Holy Ghost says there is, you're lost, you're going to hell, but if you want to go to heaven, you got to accept Jesus. He stands on, at the door of your heart and he knocks. Let him in, invite him in. You see, we all get a personal invitation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he said this, I didn't come to call the righteous. You want to know there's none righteous? No, not one. He converts us. He changes us. He saves us, but then he seals us to the day of redemption. He calls sinners to repentance. We're not saved until we get a call from the Lord Jesus. And he gets, we invite him in, we're saved, and thank God of it. Of everything that we have in this world, our salvation is the most important. You know what he says in Revelation? He said, I stand at the door and knock. He not only got up from the dead, he not only calls sinners, but he converts the soul. You think about John 3 and 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, you don't just go to heaven by your good works. You don't go to heaven because of your name or who you are or how much you've made or what you've done in this life. You only go to heaven because you accepted the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. Past sins are forgiven. Past sins are put in the sea of forgetfulness. You get to start life all over again, and you're saying, but preacher, you don't know what I've done, and how is it that all these criminals that we see on the TV and we've read about and everything that they've done, may I remind you that Jesus sailed through a storm to a place called Gadara. That man had a legion of demons in him. That man was hated by everybody and loved by no one except Jesus. And if he can save a man with a legion of demons in him, if he can put him in his right mind fully clothed, a man that lived naked among the tombs that screamed and shrieked, a man that was hated by everybody, if he can save him, put him in his right mind and then send him back to that same city telling everybody what Jesus had done for him, he can save us. You see, we're God's second creation. He created the heavens and the earth. He created Adam and Eve in his own likeness and image. Adam and Eve sinned and disobeyed God, invited the sin nature inside of them. And Jesus said, I'm going to buy him back. And he went to the cross of Calvary and he paid the sin debt that he did not owe. He shed his blood. God accepted his son as a sacrifice for our sin. And so he converts the soul. He's, we are literally God's next creation. <coughs> the old man is gone. The new man is, is now. 
We're not who we used to be. When God looks down inside of our soul, if we've been saved and we're sealed, God sees the blood of his son cleansed us from our sins and we get to go to heaven. He converts the soul so that death is everyone's appointed to die, dear friend, but after that, the judgment. But one of the comforts that we get is that if a loved one or family member dies, if we know they've been saved, we know we'll get to see them again. You see, the family don't have to worry about you after you're gone. Just as the demoniac was tried, he was confined with chains and he broke the chains, Jesus broke the chains of sin in our heart. He gives us a whole new perspective, a whole new mindset. We don't do the things we once did. We're not the same person we once was. He converts the soul. We want to do good. We want to please the Lord. Because Jesus saved us, he sealed us, and the Holy Spirit moves in. You know, it's like the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given to the New Testament church. Just as Jesus kneeled and breathed the breath of life into Adam, he became a living soul. When the Holy Spirit came and he moves inside of us, that's almost like another breath from heaven that gives us an eternal soul that we'll live forever with God in heaven. He also calms the storms. Not just the storms. Do you remember his disciples? Oh, they were on a ship and they were sailing and a storm came and they rode and they rode and they tried and they toiled and they fought till they were give up and finally somebody said, let's just tell God, Lord, don't you care that we perish? Jesus came out of that sleep. He got stood up on the bow of that boat, stood between his disciples in the storm, rebuked the wind and calmed the storm. But more importantly, it wasn't the storm that they could see. It was the storm on the inside of their heart. Jesus will take the fears of this world and give us peace. In the middle of a storm, we can have the peace of Almighty God. Look around you, dear friend, and look how wicked this world has become. Watch the six o'clock news and see it. You can't, not a, hardly a day goes by. Somebody ain't have a mass shooting. Somebody's shooting a church. They're shooting a grocery store. They're shooting and killing in a church, and they're <coughs> in a parade. People have become so wicked that they just want to kill we live in a world that's perilous times, full of danger, but yet we can still have the peace of Almighty God. We can still go to church every Sunday. We can still rejoice. He calms the storms, not just for the disciples, but for all believers. The storms of life are going to come. We're going to have our foundation shaken. We're going to live and be surrounded by danger. Sometimes the devil's going to sift us as wheat. But remember, just as he prayed for the apostle Peter, God prays for us. They gave up before the storm gave up. If you think you can outlast the storm, you better think again. We need the presence of Almighty God. We need God's power. Just as the boat filled up with water, their heart filled up with fear. You see, we worry about what doesn't happen. We worry about what might happen. We worry about what could happen. We formulate storms in our minds created by fear on what just might take place, even though most of the time it never does. But God will calm that fear. He can wake us up from our sleep, calm the fear, let us face the day. Give us the victory. You see, when those come and go in our life, God stays. He is the constant in our life. Because you see, when you go from fear to prayer, you invite Jesus Christ into that storm. And you're saying, Lord, I'm scared. 
storm's bigger than I am. I just don't know what to do. God says, come on. I'm going through the storm with you. I like the fact that they were caught in the storm a second time. It was the middle of the night. Jesus was in a, in a cave praying to his holy heavenly father. They don't know how he's going to get there, and they're in another storm in the middle of the night in the middle of the lake, and Jesus walks across the water just to, stop, just to steal the storm. The apostle Peter, buddy, he looks at that. He said, Lord, if it be thou, get me out of the boat. So do you understand when you're not walking in fear that Jesus will let you get out of the boat while the storm is still raging? And you can have the faith that even in the if your faith isn't in the boat, it's in Jesus Christ. And if Jesus ain't in the boat, he's on the water. You can get out of that boat and walk on the water and face the storm with him. If you can face the storm in the boat and then you can face the storm out of the boat, you can walk with God. And that's what the apostle Peter did. But then a kid, <coughs> he started looking at the storm and the fear came back. But Jesus, he called out to Jesus, Lord, save me. Three short words, it's the shortest prayer in the Bible. Lord, save me. And Jesus was right there and reached down his hand, pulled him back up on top of the water, and they walked back to the boat together. You see, sometimes God steals the storm to give you peace. Sometimes God just gives you peace while the storm's still raging. He doesn't have to calm the storm to give you peace. He just has to be there. You can hear his words. You can feel his touch. You can recognize his presence. And you're not worried about the storm. The apostle Peter separated himself from the other disciples. He got out of the boat, the only foundation that they all had. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. Fear came back in for a short time as he began to sink. He called out to God and they walked back on top of the water together. And you don't find that the apostle Peter ever feared another storm. So you understand he learned the most valuable lesson. He doesn't have to calm the storm on the outside that you can see if he calms the storm on the inside that only he can see. So you understand he brings peace in the midst of the storm. And the storms he calms, he can calm the one that everybody can see around us. He can calm the, the storms of fear on the inside of us. But even if he doesn't, he can still bring peace in the midst of a storm. So you understand when he calms the storms, he's really calming us. And when the multitudes are gone, just like he proved with the Apostle Peter, he didn't have the other disciples to hang on to. He didn't have the other disciples to put their arm around him. He didn't have the other disciples to calm him with their words of kindness. He had Jesus. And if you've got Jesus, if it's nobody in the storm but you and him, he'll calm that storm. He calms the troubled seas. But you see, regardless of what's in the boat, as long as Jesus is in the boat, if Jesus is just on the water, as long as Jesus is in the storm, he'll calm you. And the last thing, he's the only Savior that says, I'm coming again. When he walked his disciples outside the city and they saw him leave on a glory cloud, he said, I'm going to promise you a few things. He said, number one, he said, I'm sending a comforter. But then again, he says, I'm coming back to get you. And he, then that angel said, do you see that Jesus that just left on this cloud? He says, he's coming back like manner. Every time you look up and see a cloud, that's a reminder that Jesus is coming back. We've never been forsaken. We've not been forgotten. He's coming back. You'll never find any false god, any false prophet, any false religion, any false belief that can make the claim that he's coming back to get you. One day Jesus is going to step out on that cloud He's going to call us home, and we're leaving this world behind. So I'm going to tell you, 
As I close, Jesus says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Put your faith, your hope, your trust in the only truth, the only way, the only life, the only Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Have a blessed day.